There we go. <laughs> I was wondering if you uh, pictured either Sean or Lance or Carrie as either listening to any of your songs or being part of that universe. I kind of pictured Carrie and Lance as kids in band class with Jeff and Cyrus before those two went off to. No, the mountain goats aren't really part of this whole deal. It's like because it's so. It's not. Yeah, all the stuff that I write takes place in the world where the mountain goats never formed. Right? It's because that would be weird for me. It's like what I. I think I, I've come. I've made my peace with the idea that everything you write is somehow about you, but at the same time, like I'm not going to write a memoir. I, I don't like to sit around thinking about myself if I can help it. Right? And so, because then it distracts me from doing the stuff that I, that I think is good. So. I love having somebody else to call on people. It removes the anxiety. You don't have to go, oh man, who should I pick? <laughs> it doesn't remove my anxiety. Um, <laughs> I have a, a kind of a two part question. Um, first of all, where did the original seed of the idea for Sean come from? And secondly, um, do you think that he would have found a different way to isolate himself had the accident not been part of the narrative? Uh, uh, say that last bit again. So, had. The accident, as it's referred to right. throughout the novel, not been part of the narrative, would he found, have found a different way to isolate himself? So he addresses this question in one of my favorite lines in the book, right, where uh, where his, his mother, after he's injured himself, uh, says, I worry that you'll be lonely. And he says, I was going to be lonely anyway. Right? I mean, that's who he is, right, uh, in a, you know, he, d he didn't have to be as profoundly lonely as he didn't have to act out his loneliness so severely. But that's, that's who and where he is, right? He doesn't fit in. Uh, and what was the first part? Um, why did the original see the idea? Oh, the original see the idea. Where did it come from? Um, I mean, probably from Dream Deceivers, this documentary about these two kids who shot themselves um, after listening to Jewish Priest all day. But like all stories like that, I mean, that was how they tried to sell it when, if you don't know the story, the family of one of the kids uh, sued Judas Priest, right? Uh, the heavy metal band from the 80s. <laughs> uh, and uh, Judas Priest is a, a bunch of working class guys who, who, who made good and... Uh, and, you know, but they dressed in leather and chains. There was a sort of a, you know, a and m shop feel to their presentation. And, and uh, but their songs are, you know, they're just heavy metal. They're, 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 they're that old style of heavy metal, they're sort of like actually about hopes and dreams, but with kind of dark, badass edge, you know, and stuff. Um, they're fanciful. They're fantasy. They're, they're, they're a place you can go to escape. But they had a wicked feeling, and there was this panic about heavy metal that was it's still, it gets weirder and harder to understand every year. But the, but the parents sued Judas Priest for putting backwards masking messages in their records, which of course they hadn't done. Uh, but Judas Priest had to go to Nevada, right? Uh, Nevada, right? They're from Birmingham, England. Um, <laughs> and they had to put all their touring and everything else on hold to go for like a six week trial because one of the kids died and the other was just terribly disfigured, right? Uh, and they reconstructed his face um, and he was willing to say that, you know, we always got these ideas listening to the music. In the trial, it, it's a hard documentary to watch because they have to ask, well, what what's daily life like in your house? How many times have you been married? You know, is it not true that you've had problems with these kids for the last 10 years, you know, and so forth, and, uh, and it's really difficult. But, uh, but the idea of hearing things in backwards stuff has always been so exciting to me. So I wound up, I was looking on the internet for stuff, and I found out that uh, there was this, uh, Larry Norman, the founder of Christian Rock, was reputed to have put the phrase wolf in white van into a song of his. Whatever could it possibly mean? I think, you know, why is that scary or bad to do that? <laughs> and so, so yeah. So I just, I mean, I had nothing to do on a morning, and I started typing. And I typed. It was me, you know, Tara, JJ, and and Kimmy. And I was like, okay, cool. Kimmy was an actual person I knew who I smoked cigarettes with in the seventh grade, and. Uh, you know, and the scene was like something from high school, so it was kind of just a writing exercise. And at the end of the chapter I wrote that morning, this big thing happened, and then I had to figure out what else to do with it. So. Back here. Um, the excerpt from The Father was unbelievable. It was very stirring. Thank I'm, you. I'm wondering um, what was the reason you shifted the novel to only be Sean's point of view? <sighs> Well, the multiple narrators that weren't going anywhere, right? It was like they were all very interesting, and they all, I mean, it's a, uh, I'm a performer by nature, right? And so I like to do stuff that gets a reaction out of people, right? If I can make you cry, then I'm, you know, it makes me feel good, right? And so, 
<laughs> I mean, I, I know that sounds sadistic. It's not, you know, because I, I guess I'm getting emotional too. It's more of a shared thing, but still, you know, and all the chapters had some of that. In it. It's like, because you were only with somebody long enough to like go to that point and then you don't have to live with them longer and find out that they're complex, right? And, uh, or the complexities you're allowed to see are shorter, but it was like, it was just ranging all over the place. I couldn't rein it in and I thought, well, you know, no wonder you have 10 people trying to tell stories, right? And it's chaos. And uh, it took a long time to get to that phase and I, you know, at one point I thought, well, maybe the middle section will just be one narrator and I had all these other things. And probably, if I didn't have to do the Mountain Goats, I would have written that book instead, right? I would, because it, but it, I would have been a full-time thing and it's like, I can't, you know, I, things like that are for, for people who, you know, spend a lot more time by themselves than I'm able to do. <laughs> so, uh, so I was writing through one character. I'm used to this, right? It's like, once you do that, I can do it in the van. You know, I can do it anywhere. I just have to sort of go into the space where these other guys, it was harder. Uh, my old bassist uh, really wanted me to keep that scene in because she heard it at the first reading I ever gave on this when the book was still being written. So. Um. How much of the Trace Italian game exists outside the book? It and doesn't at all. It does, at all. This is the only, yeah. And I, I don't even think there's any extra chapters with moves that got ditched. I mean, that's all, it is a theoretical presence. Okay, and um, I guess like, what are your inspirations for doing that stuff? Um, so what was it? It was, it was pretty simple. It was a uh, classic, writing workshop stuff, the kind of stuff that when I was like very young, I was like, I don't want to ask, they'd say, well, here are the five questions you ask me you're writing. Who, what, why, where, when? And I'd be, what if I don't want to ask any of those questions? <laughs> so what, what if I, I, mean, you know, I, I, just, I really resisted that, but this is what I did. I said, well, you've got this guy and he is disfigured, so how does he make money? Did he sue somebody or is he on disability? And if so, where does he live? Because you can't really get, you know, disability doesn't give you that much money. It's really bare subsistence or supplementary money. Does he live at home? I don't think he lives at home. He's got to have some kind of a job, but he can't work retail, I don't suppose. You know, I mean, he could, but it doesn't feel like, it feels like it would be hard uh, for him to do that. So what would he do that would become, so well, mail order, something with mail order, right? And if it had been more about music than about fantasy gaming, he probably would have run a distro, right? Like a, a, a Ajax, right? So, uh, but, but instead I thought I made up this game, right? I thought, no, you could do that, play a game through the mail. I thought in my mind, didn't there used to be such a thing? And I didn't really, I didn't find out until the book was done from Jason Morningstar. Yeah, I know there were a couple people who used to do it through the mail and, uh, and you can still try and sign up for it online. But when I tried, my email bounced. I was very upset. So. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was also totally floored by the, uh, the, the, f the first thing that you read about the dad. Thank you. Um, and I wanted to ask, this is maybe, uh, I don't know, so does the perspective or the character of the father, how much of that has, is connected to your own experience as a, a recent father? Well, all that was written long before we were even pregnant. Oh, okay. Was, yeah, that, was so the, that, that predates me being a father by several years uh, before it was even an idea in our house. So, so none. <laughs> The thing is, I'll tell you all, man, if you're artists, is like, people really are desperate to hear the effect of becoming a father in your work. They ask it constantly as soon, like from the day the kid's born, they start going, oh man, this new song, right? You go, no, man, I dug that one out of mothballs. It's been sitting around for 20 years. Sounds like you're a like, dad rock to me, right? You, <laughs> it's, you tell me more about yourself when you hear that than you are about my work. <laughs> but yeah, it's like, I'm not completely averse to it, but at the same time, uh, I don't... I have an attitude problem about uh, artists who become parents and instead of two years, think they're expert enough to write a book about it. <laughs> if you will be doing something for two years, you don't know that much about it. <laughs> so that's my take on that. Hi, I'm a big fan and that Thank was you. a good reading. Um, so I guess my question is, while you're writing the book, does writing about loneliness feel therapeutical or does it resurface dark feelings or is it just like both of those things writing about like being alone? Well, writing is so technical that it doesn't, it's not performative. The actual, and kind of is when you're, I mean, I pace a lot when I write, but, uh, but the actual writing is so much making sure the sentences sound mellifluous next to each other, you know, that, that everything flows. It's only when I'm reading it out loud and fixing it and throwing out all the extraneous, you know, clauses and 
and splitting up really long sentences into three shorter ones and stuff like that. When I'm reading out loud, then I can get, I'm trying to think of what section it was that I read to my wife that I remember going, well, this is very, oh, it was the courtroom scene, the, uh, the scene where he reads his statement, or the lawyer reads his statement, you know, it, it felt therapeutic in some way, but I don't, I try not to think about that too much. I try not to really do a lot of thinking about, about the nature of what I'm doing or to reflect on it too much. I, I try to focus on it the way you would on, like, making a watch. It's like if you sit there and think about the math of it, you'd go nuts, and so you just got to look at the little tiny parts. Hi. Um, how did the writing and editing process for this differ from your, uh, like your albums? I mean, it's just not, they don't, it's totally different. It's just not, I mean, this is, and it took years, took like five years to write. Um, and uh, and with, it, with a song, I mean, I finish my songs in the morning and I edit them myself and nobody has any say. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you a story about uh, the Sunset Tree Sessions. The thing is, this is a story where I'm going to brag about my own arrogance, right? so, which I normally try to hide from people. You know? But in the studio, uh, I'm more mellow than I used to be, but I'm still pretty, I'm very protective of my ideas. This will be a long answer. I'm going to warn you about this. So, so one thing that happens in the studio uh, when you have multi-tracking, and this has gotten worse in the digital age, is people go, you know, what if we put a zither on there? And me... <laughs> I immediately go, well, what's the zither sound like? No, nah, I don't think I want it. I don't think so, right? And then everybody else generally says, well, let's put it on. And then if you don't like it, we can take it back off. And that's where I always say, nah, you know what's going to happen? You're going to put your zither on. And then when I try and take it off, you can go, oh, I can't really even hear it without the zither now. We've got to put something else where the zither was. And I'll be like, no, we all agreed it was fine until we start adding stuff and then saying we could take it off. So I have this principle of hesitance, whereas everybody else has a sort of throw all the ingredients in the pot, you can take them back out if you like. It's probably the more sober-minded position, but I like mine. Um, so, so that, but that's really stressful to do because literally everybody else has the throw everything on it and then take it off and mix thing is what they do. Um, that's where my head's at in the studio. I was more protected than ever on the Sunset Tree. I wanted it to sound exactly like I wanted it to sound, right? Um, and uh, and we are back listening back to what song was it? It wasn't dance music. I'm not going to remember which one it was, but. Vanderslice suggested that I change a word, right? I, and he said, what if, what if instead of this you sang, and he's earnest, very the friendliest guy in the world, he said, you know, what if instead of, you know, and you, you sang then? And it's like one in the morning, and I, I mean, I didn't know I was really doing it, and I went, And he said, or, or, or not, or not. <laughs> so, I mean, when I'm making music, I am a megalomaniac, right? It's like, I, I'm much easier about it than I used to be. I'm open to ideas, and we really write together now in the musical aspect. But the lyrics, I mean, literally nobody has any say. If I said something completely from left field, where like, John, this doesn't sound like you, you're swearing a lot, you know, and, and uh, you know, you're repeating the chorus at the end of the song a lot and doing all stuff that you don't do, they would probably say that. But otherwise, lyrically, it's done by the time anybody else hears it. Whereas with the book, uh, I wrote it, I sent it in, and I was really fierce on my own editing because I really wanted the approval of my editor because I'm Catholic, so I need approval from people <laughs> who have power, and uh, it's really important to me to get that approval. So, so I wanted to deliver the cleanest copy possible, and I was told that I had, in fact, done that, and I felt pretty good. And, uh, uh, but there was not... The editing mostly took place with me and it was on the floor, cutting the manuscript up and, and rearranging parts and like that. And it's really, really very labor intensive, whereas writing songs is a lot more just performative. Hello. Uh, so this is a question that was in the New York Times recently, but I'm interested to get your thoughts on it. Um, do you think that characters who are sort of good or undisturbed can be interesting? Oh, yeah. And do you have examples, and what are some authors who inspire you right now? Um, I always want to name Willa Cather. I think people wind up reading Just O Pioneers or My Antonia in high school and, and maybe don't go further, but she's one of the greatest writers ever. And she tends to write about people who are just living their lives. And it's one thing that's so inspiring about her is you go, why did this book move me so much? Nobody did anything extreme, right? And so, whereas we live in the age of extremity, and my own book is not an exception. It's like people have to do things to get your attention. Whereas when books were more, 
was a terrible pun. When books were more novel, uh, <laughs> uh, that was less necessary. You look at earlier books, Defoe and stuff like that. I mean, Robinson Crusoe is a remarkable story, but a lot of those early books are just like, check it out. Story starts here and it moves along, and other things happen in people's lives, you know. Um, but but I totally think you know uh, that normal stories can be interesting. I think Aristotle has a lot to say about this. Like, you want a conflict. So once a conflict happens, that disturbs stasis. So already you have something unusual. If you have no con conflict, then you have a pretty strange story, right? You have something where it's just people. You could do that, but most people want a little, a little something to to gnaw on. Um, but I think I don't. I don't think narrators or characters have to be odd in any way. But I'm kind of odd, so that's mainly what I know, right? It's like for me to write, I think about this a lot when I'm writing about families. Um, I don't come from, and I don't know who does come from a normal family, but uh, I don't know whether the idea is really healthy, but, uh, but, but if I try to write about a family, you know, where you can invite somebody in without having to tell people to put some clothes on, right? Uh, I don't know what that's like, you know? It's like, I know what it's like in my own life now, but back when I'd try to write about families and it would just, to me, I'd go, I, I, you're guessing, you might as well write science fiction, you know? It's, so, so yeah, it's, I, that's the other thing, is I suspect people write what they know, and what many people know is actually quite distinctive. Hi, um, so I was wondering, is there any particular author who you, know, you read and you look at and you say, this is a prose style that I'm interested in sort of imitating my own work, or do you, do you find it all just kind of comes naturally and you write just what comes to you and it's not free from influence, but sort of a subconscious thing? So I don't think there's anybody I want to sound like. I mean, I want to be, uh, do my own thing. Right, but there are people who I read who I go, oh, that's amazing. You know, Joan Didion is what I'm always saying. Her sentences are astonishing. But like William Gass, I love William Gass. The only way to be influenced by William Gass would be to write bad William Gass. Right? And I, I found this happening because when I was working on this, I was reading Middle C, his most recent one, and it, he's one of those guys, you know, it's like if a young songwriter listens to Leonard Cohen on a Monday morning and then tries to write a song Monday evening, he's gonna sound like bargain basement Leonard Cohen, right? He's gonna, <laughs> he's gonna think he's got four rhymes in a row that are super hip and he's gonna punish the idea for eight consecutive verses, you know, because he doesn't realize that it takes Leonard five years to write those songs, right? So, uh, so with gas, it's like that, but, but I, uh, uh, there's nobody that I want to sound like, but I do want, the ones whose sentences are really good are the ones that I'm the most into. I want my sentences to seem very good. In a quiet way, though, I don't want them to dazzle you know, it's like when they get, when you descend at a few points in this book into a nice rhetorical sort of miasma, then that's cool. But for the most part, I admire Joan Didion, who calls so little attention to her astonishing sentences that that's what I want to, that, that's the effect I want. I don't want you to have noticed what I did. Right? Hi, John. I'm curious if you've ever thought of turning the book into a film. I haven't. Some other people have. <laughs> so maybe who knows? I mean, I don't... Uh, I know so little about movies, I hardly ever see them. Uh, and I don't know who any of the actors are. And I have heavy issues with how everybody in movies is beautiful. Uh, you know, it's like... The movies can be great, but most of the movies I see are horror movies where not everybody's beautiful, right? And so, uh, and documentaries. So, so I don't, you know, there's been some talk about it. We'll see. It's not a priority for me, but who knows? I'm not against it. You know? Hi, I'm hey. a really big fan. Thank it's you. great to be here. Um, after you read the expert about the f excerpt about the father, it was really incredible. And when I read the book itself, it was very hard to tell whether or not Sean was a sympathetic character. Mm. Um, in the father's, it, it kind of made me actually sympathize with him more because yeah. of the way his father like was so angry. Yeah. So did you mean for him to be like this very complex character? Was he just supposed to be, you know, one way or the other? I try to write everybody complex. I don't believe in straight sympathetic characters or, uns or evil villains. You know, I don't, I mean, I like evil villains, like, you know, but, but, uh, but I mean, I wanted to write a book with real people in it, which means that everybody is horrible sometimes and everybody is sometimes as good as they can be. Uh, it's funny, I was worrying about reading uh, this section this morning because, you know, uh, the father, Patrick, uh, uh, 
expounds that philosophy that people do uh, about suicide being a selfish act, which some people take very serious issue with that claim, right? Um, but I like the way that he gives voice to, to what a person who says that means uh, from a personal place is. But, uh, but yeah, I don't... My hope is that my characters are neither sympathetic nor unsympathetic, but like people in your lives, which is a foolish way to write because most people want heroes and villains, right? The people who want to I love him and I hate him, right? But I don't want that in my songs or my, my books. I want, I want people who seem like they're real, which means that they're all kind of scumbags and they're all kind of great. So. Hi. Hey. Love the book. Thank you. Um, I'm a high school teacher, All right. and I noticed that in the high school scenes there is a pretty conspicuous lack of teachers, and I was wondering if that was... Um, <laughs> well, I, think, I don't think that's true. There's, there's two scenes. There's one where they're hanging out at the park, and then there's the one with Mr. Rasmussen, right? The teacher, and he's in the class, right? He's, uh, right. But and he I gives an assignment, right? We talk about the assignment, right? About the five things you want to be when you grow up, right? But I was wondering um, sort of what you might perceive Sean's relationship to be to his teachers and if that would have affected his uh, story arc. It's not something I really went into. Um, it's not, I didn't really reflect on it that much. I assume he's a good, a decent student who likes his teachers fine, you know. Um, <laughs> but, but I mean, he's, he's very, Sean is self-absorbed. Uh, for a lot of people who are self-absorbed being in classes that, you know, sit in the back row and do your own thing <laughs> and, and try and pass the test. So that's, that's the sort of student I assume Sean is. Hi. Um, how do you know when you've written every piece of detail that your story requires? You do not know. <laughs> you do not know. You have to. Uh, I'm always, I've, I've been citing this line like practically every time I talk about the book and I still don't know who said it. Um, uh, it, it writing is, is never uh, completed, only abandoned. Right? It's like, that's what you do. You eventually give up. You go, I don't think, every, like, you go, I don't think that, uh, you know, I don't think there's anything more. Well, let me write another scene. You look at it, nah, nah, right? But I'll tell you, so, so I, I was, you know, what I did was I had a bunch of stuff and I wrote the, the final scene. Uh, or no, did I? No, no, no. I, I knew I was getting up to that final scene, but we already knew what happened. And then I wrote the end after something. And then I didn't like it. And then I wrote some more. I wrote the end and I cut it back off. Let me show you something. This was kind of cool. Um, so the original end of the book, uh, or maybe the second end, uh, if you've read the book, hopefully you, well the book's 207 pages long, this is page 202, and there was a draft where this was the final scene. Mom was in her purple nightgown when I got home, it was about 9.30, there was another TV in the bedroom and Dad was back there watching, I could hear it. Mom asked how studying went and I said great, and she asked what we studied and I said American history. She told a story about her history teacher in high school, and my head was so full of other stuff it was hard to listen, even though it wasn't like I didn't care, but I had to struggle to pay attention. What have you got there? She said. One of those free magazines, I said. I handed it to her. She looked at the cover, her eyes sleepy but focusing hard. Who hid the Dead Sea Scrolls? She said. Jehovah's Witnesses? I guess, I said. The end. And, that was, that was, and, and I looked at it, I was really, I was like so excited about this. I was like, ah, oh, take them all that way and then, you know, you're really certain something's going to happen in the next chapter. No, you don't get to see it, right? I was, I was, very, I was very excited about this idea. And then I, I lived with that for a month or so and I said, no, I mean, I like it, but I think, I think we need to go inside his head in that last hour and see what it feels like in there, right? And so uh, so then I wrote and rewrote the last scene and I really enjoyed, I mean, it's kind of embarrassing to admit how much I enjoyed writing this horrible thing, but it's very florid, you know, it's very, he's, he's getting very exaggerated and operatic and I enjoyed that. And so then I knew when that one was done, you know from rhythm at that point. Thanks for coming. Um, of course. You're in a room with a lot of people that I think relate to you through your art, whether it's your music or your writing. Yeah. Uh, and I was curious what it's like to walk into a room like that to talk about things that might be very personal or were part of a personal experience for you. Um, it depends on, you know, the venue. It depends on what I'm doing. Uh, depends on where I'm at on a given day. But again, 
like I'm really, I try very hard not to live blog my life. I try not to reflect too hard on what I'm doing. I'm not like full on, you know, uh, Ram Dass about it, you know, but, but, but I try not to say, well, what's this like? You know, I try to say what was something like afterwards. But if I'm thinking too hard about what an experience is like, then I can't have the experience, right? And, uh, and this is why I get all, you know, cantankerous about people filming with a cell phone. It's like, you are not a person watching a show. You're a person holding up a cell phone, so you can't watch the show, right? That you to get into so uh, so but that's how I mean you know I try not to think too hard about it but I get therapy and we talk about it there you know because it is very intense it's 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 not natural um, and there's this weirdness that people think because if I've written something moving you know or said something right on that I am a good person that's a very uncomfortable burden to have on you because I'm not any and the idea that I'm like better than people because I'm able to articulate my values is absurd. <laughs> it's like no, I'm glad that we share values, but that's just like human, you know. And so, so that's weird when people think you're really good. You know, well, that's a giant burden. It's the same burden, you know, that you have with your children. It's like someday your children are going to learn that you are just a person who has no idea what he's doing, right? And so, you know, and then it's going to be a harsh day for them. So, so anyway, yeah. Hey, um, so one of my favorite lines was the part about um, he's going to the supermarket and he can't do that anymore. Yeah. And he's like, he says, like, I missed it, like, I missed the train. Right. And I, and I, I almost missed that. Like, right. I, and then for a minute, I... Look that, closer to your mouth. So we, that's what made it so powerful, is that yeah. I didn't get it right away, and so I sat with it, and I was like, oh, that's what he meant. Yeah. And when you write a line like that, do you know, like, are you, like, do you know, like, that's a golden egg? When it's a simile, yeah. Right, when you're writing, <laughs> you know, if it's a simile, you know, if you get a good one, you feel it. You go, ah, oh, that seems pretty. But I mean, I remember going, you know, I miss it like I would miss, and I, and you know, did what you do. He said, well, what do you miss? You miss a person, you miss, you know, miss the train. I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I mean, with those ones, you, but the thing with a simile or a metaphor, they're very different creatures, um, is that you, you try one and then you sit and live with it. And if it, if it takes a minute to digest, it tends to be a better one where you go, oh, that's an odd thing to say. Is it true or not? Right? And you sit there and you chew on it for a little while and, yeah. Hi. Hey. Um, so fantasy role-playing games and tabletop games are something yeah. that are very dear to my heart. So awesome. I was wondering what your relationship with those types of games are, sort of what drew you to write about them, if you consider yourself an insider or an observer to that type of subculture. Well, I have some inside stuff now, because when I was revising, word got out among our peer group that I was writing this book, and one uh, a friend of mine, Clinton, um, uh, he or his wife said, hey, you know, Clinton has a weekly gaming thing if you ever wanted to try. I said, oh, cool. Because my one, I've told this story a lot of times, sorry if you've heard it before. My one attempt to play D&D, &D, uh, on the first session, I tried to attack a ghost. <laughs> and the dungeon master said, well, you don't, you can't beat him, right? You don't, you should run away. And I said, you know, everybody's got a chance. <laughs> <laughs> And what, what the DM should have said is like, well, no, this isn't that kind of game. Not, you know, it's numbers. Either you can or can't. So I rolled the dice, and I got killed, and I went, this game sucks, right? So uh, I went back to taking drugs instead. And, uh, but, uh, but, but yeah, so when I was revising, I wanted to get a little experience. And uh, I play with uh, Clinton and John Bolding, who writes for The Escapist, and... Um, and uh, Joel and Kate and Jason Morningstar, who is a game designer, he's got a new game out called Night Witches, where everybody plays a member of the Night Witches, these uh, Soviet uh, women pilots who flew these junk planes on low-flying distraction missions. I, and they were, most of them were flying in the face of certain doom, right? They were just there to cause the Germans to waste ammo, right? And to, and to distract. And uh, so there are no uh, male characters to be played in this game. Everybody plays one of the Night Witches. And uh, uh, so I do that. I mean, now I have a weekly game. It's Tuesday nights. That's what I do. So uh, if my Twitter goes quiet on Tuesday nights, you know why. So. <laughs> We have, we have we have time for one more question. What if I went into a rage? Like, I'll answer all the questions I want. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, will you take this to that? 
Thanks. Um, so when you read a book, it's it always feels intentional, like every line is intentional. Right. And I think that your book really feels that way, and it makes sense then that you spend a lot of time with each and every sentence. Um, so, and especially the book also feels very tightly wound and everything really connects. So is there anything when you were writing that was a surprise to you that wasn't intentional and you're you know, glad you the story led you there? Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot, but I'm trying to, uh, off the top of my head, it's hard to remember them. Um, in the, in the, uh, Chris Haynes, my favorite character in the book, I think, um, uh, the Chris Haynes scenes, like, I got the idea for this guy, but they played out really naturally when I was writing them, so I, could, I didn't have to really plot them, and then those were fun to do. Um, you know, and then I was surprised uh, that dialogue snaps for me that I don't have to because you know when I was trying to write fiction when I was 12 and 13 years old that was where it's like I knew you'd read it you go that is bad that's terrible it does not sound real right and uh, and I feel like my dialogue actually kind of pops which is surprising to me because I remember struggling with it as a young writer uh, and it's probably why you didn't get a book from me earlier is my assumption that dialogue is going to be hard but I mean, it's not easy but but it once I get into the voices, it's pretty easy to ping pong back and forth and, and hold two or three in my head. So that was surprising to me that like how, once I start doing dialogue, I mean, this maybe is not surprising given how I'm just constantly talking, right? So, um, but, uh, but it just sort of flows and scenes develop in dialogue where people are asking each other questions that answer your own questions that you hadn't actually asked yet about where the action is going, right? They ask a question that just naturally occurs and you go, oh yeah, well, that is the question. Where are you, gonna, where are you going from this hospital? Are you going directly home or are you going to treatment, right? And you know, those, those always were surprising to me.